Hi guys, um, and welcome back to my ASMR channel, and welcome back to another true crime um, episode. Um, hello also from future me, because basically <laughs> when I went to edit my video um, yesterday, I found out that my intro is missing the video. I definitely filmed it, but I don't know what's happened to it so yeah i'm having to like film right now so that's why it's like low fi without my mic and i look a mess but anyway i just wanted to quickly like film the intro for you guys but um this case is about a 15 year old girl called cara robinson and the story is so crazy um She's so brave, um, so clever for a 15 year old, so yeah, I hope you guys um, enjoy this video, sit back and relax and let's get into it. So, um, I put the mic, um, I've turned the green up a little bit and the cane up and um, I took the mic off the stand, so I'm currently holding it. I know that the wires are kind of making a sound so I do apologise for that, but I wanted to like do a crisp uh, videos in close whispers for you guys to make it more ASMR free. So anyway, let's get on into it. So we're gonna go to June the 24th, 2022, which was only a couple of years ago, so it's quite recent. So 
She was surprised to find that the place was littered with cages and aquariums, all of which held various small animals. Among the residents were an odd assortment of lizards, guinea pigs and tropical fish. Feeling trapped in much the same way, she had felt a strange affinity for the creatures who peered out at her from behind the glass and wire. Before getting down to the inevitable, the man had taken out a pen and notepad, as cool and collected as anyone she'd ever met. He had spent the next hour asking her personal questions and recording her answers in his ledger, which is really weird, I don't understand, but anyway, I don't understand why he wants this unless he just wants to know, like, if anyone would come looking for her, he could put a stop to it, or like, I don't know, if he just wanted to know about, because he just wants to know about his victims for some weird reason to get a kick out of it, I don't know. When he had all the information he needed for his records, he had abandoned his research and moved on to the real per reason behind the abduction. <sighs> Over the course of the next 18 hours, Kara was raped repeatedly. Fearing that her attacker would turn violent if she resisted, <sighs> she had rep rep suppressed her urge to scream and fight back, which is absolutely uh, awful. The fact that she just had to, she felt the need, she like, just felt like she couldn't do anything, so she just had to endure it for long, for long, like, for constant, constant like, in order to endure what was happening to her. She tried best to disconnect from reality, so, like, kind of like, dissociation, so she wouldn't feel, you know, all the emotions that was happening. While her body was being abused, she allowed her mind to drift some place far away where she was safe from e the evils of the material world. In between the assaults, Sakara would speak to her assailant like a boyfriend, rather than the rapist that he was. Little by little, she earned his trust by feeding his ego, which he could tell made him feel ten feet tall. Even though she'd been repulsed by him in every way, she was willing to assume the role of submissive admirer if it meant seeing her family again. Honestly, despite all that she's going through, this girl, what a brave girl, what a brave and strong girl. I don't know anyone who would think like this and be able to do this and go through all this horrible, horrible stuff. And yet, she's like, oh yeah, all she's thinking about is wanting to see her family again. So she is literally just telling this guy whatever he wants to hear, just so that she can get back home. Even as she played the game, she was busy gathering evidence that she believed would be helpful in the future. When he lit up a cigarette, she made a mental note that it was a Marlboro Red. When he took her into the kitchen, she had scanned the business cards that were stuck to the re refrigerator by magnets. By the time they left the room, she had committed the names of both his dentist and personal physician to memory. This girl, honestly, I can't help. She's 15 and like, like I, I'm, I actually can't. She's 
killed them. 
surfaced in a pond in King, King George County, Virginia. Despite exhaustive efforts on the part of local law enforcement, her murder went unsolved. Coincidentally, Richard Yvonne happened to be living a half hour away in Fredericksburg at the time. Seven months later, on May the 1st, 1997, 15 year old Kristen Fisk and her 12 year old sister, Katie or Katy, disembarked from their respective school buses just after 3 pm. It was the last time they would be seen alive by anyone other than a killer. When their father arrived home from work a couple of hours later, he found Christine's book bag lying discarded in the grass. After determining that the girls hadn't made it through the front door, he knew in his gut that something wasn't right. With his heart in his throat, he had phoned authorities and reported his daughter's missing. On May the 6th, Christine and Katie's remains were floating under a bridge near the South Anna River, some 40 miles from where they were last seen. The location where the bodies was found was less than an hour from the Yvonne's residence. With the body count rising, a task force was formed with the sole purpose of finding the man responsible for the kidnappings, probably settles and murders of the three young girls. Although 12,000 leads were pursued, none of them proved fruitful. Likewise, the DNA taken from the bodies along with their fiber evidence couldn't be connected to any of the suspects. The carpet fibers taken from Yvonne's former home in Fredericksburg were compared to those found on all three girls. They were a match. Fibers collected from a blanket in his apartment in South Carolina were also determined to be microscopically indistinguishable from those discovered discovered on the girl's remains. A forensic examination of the trunks and revealed that a palm print found in the inside of the trunk belonged to Christine Risk. Her fingerprints were also discovered inside the vehicle five years after her abduction and murder. Blue fibers discovered clinging to the victim's remains matched the faux fur on the handcuffs that Cara had worn when she made her daring escape. As it turned out, all the girls had been snatched in broad daylight from their own front yards or that of home where they were staying. A look into the now deceased perpetrator's past showed that he had a long history of disturbing behaviour. In 1987, he had approached a 15-year-old girl who was out walking with her three-year-old sister in Jacksonville, Florida. Though he had seemed friendly at first, things had turned ugly when he had zipped his pants and began masturbating in front of him. What a sick bastard. Yvonne was arrested and charged with lewd exposure after the teenager spotted him on the street and pointed him out to her parents. After being ordered to pay a small fee, he was released without serving any jail time. Apparently, in their infinite wisdom, the powers that he decided that his offence had been nothing more than a momentary lapse in judgment. In reality, it was a death run for an ultimately murder. I'm, I'm sorry, a momentary lapse in judgment. I don't know, a momentary 
about 